I'd say probably have three key learnings. The first one is about the increasing need for pivots, for flexibility, for rapid action. Typically, we order our products three months in advance and then COVID hits. And, you know, we have this unprecedented, unexpected surge in consumer demand. And it really took lots of teams working together, you know, across cultures, across functions, across time zones to ensure that we don't disappoint our customers. The second key learning for me would really be about opportunity and adversity. So, for example, we know that in Southeast Asia, uh, our consumers aren't going to be able to travel this holiday season. So we're bringing in a range of festive indulgence that you can bring home. So we've got these new chocolate products launching like a dark chocolate ganache with almond and Belgian chocolate with hazelnut. And, and we're hopeful that that will bring a little bit of joy to our consumers. And the third key takeaway for me is that as, as human beings really, our love for food just never dies. So you've seen time and again in different crises that food as a business and as an industry is both anti-cyclical and recession proof. And this crisis is no different. What is interesting this time is the willingness of consumers to invest behind quality, behind brands they trust, and be willing to pay for premium quality even in challenging times. Business travel is very limited, face-to-face -face interaction has been limited. So we've really had to find new ways to evolve, to adapt, to innovate in our ways of working. I think one of the outcomes that has struck me as a result of this is actually the democratization of information, which means that actually it's become much more easier for people at all levels of the organization to access information because it's no longer dependent on having to travel somewhere and therefore having needing budget approvals or needing to take that time out of your regular job to make it happen. Some of the examples of this would be last week, I was actually doing a virtual tour of our cake kitchen in Korea. Or this week, I've literally just come out of a multi-market brainstorming session where marketeers across from Australia to the Middle East and India have all come together to think about the way forward on certain critical issues on our business and our brands. If you look at the Southeast Asia region, right, we account for about 8% of the world's population. So we have around 670 million people, which if you think about it, is more than half the population of India or China but we sometimes don't get the same importance as you talk about the Asian region in general, right? Um, and, and there is, if you look at the markets in this region, there are two large markets, Ind Indonesia and the Philippines, which house almost 50% of the region's population. But there are other markets like Singapore, for example, which has a, the highest per capita GDP by almost a 10 times ratio um, and therefore has a special role to play in itself. Now, when you look at launching in one of these markets, it really varies by brand and it varies by the market. So entering an Indonesia or a Philippines is very different from entering a Singapore or a Malaysia because the level of investment, uh, the time, the, um, the resources, the complexity is very different, but then the size of price is also very different. You look at Singapore or Malaysia, they're a bit more efficient, easier to enter, and that's often why they're the first port of call for a lot of international premium brands. That said, I'd say when you enter a new market, three things to keep in mind is the first most important one is to nail the consumer target. So who really are you going after and why are they interested in your brand? And it's, you know, we've got to get beyond looking at broad metrics like, oh, what's the population, et cetera, and really think about what's the total addressable market. The second is about the channel strategy. So being in the right channel with the right products at the right price is really critical. You take Thailand as an example, 50% of food retail is actually in the 7-Eleven or CVS channel. And that means that you need to, and the price points are at about 20 baht, which is about roughly 50 US cents. Right? So you need to have the right size products at the right price point in that 
channel to really be successful in that market. And the third, just from a food perspective, is it's important to consider um, food regulation and compliance, which varies across markets. So for example, in our region, uh, Malaysia and Indonesia, you have to be halal compliant and halal certified. Um, and that's an important consideration. So yeah, I'd say those three, understanding the consumer, understanding the channels, and then ensuring that you've covered all the regulatory and compliance aspects. I have to say as a brand, we're probably moving away from online versus offline and into a more omni-channel approach. And the idea behind that is really to be where our consumers are at all points in the journey. So as you walk a high street in Singapore or in Malaysia or in Thailand, you might come across one of our shops. And that really is a big part of the offline experience. But even as you walk into that shop, you could choose to become a member and join our loyalty program. And then the engagement moves off online. Most of our marketing dollars are actually spent online. Um, and that's really about being where our consumers are and they're on social media. Uh, and so YouTube and Instagram become an important part of our, of our marketing mix. But really it's about what gets us the best reach and efficiency. We also experiment with platforms like Spotify um, and TikTok to see how we can learn and grow with our consumers on those platforms. Don't Hold Back is our global brand idea, and this one has really been a journey. It's been a, a journey where we've listened to consumers and partnered with them to understand what really drives and motivates them. It's also a shift from a demographic target, which is all about age and life stage of a consumer, to an attitudinal target. So Don't Hold Back is really about telling our consumers to make the most of those moments every day of real joy and to do it by being present and being in the moment. From an external perspective, I think it's more of a focus on omni-channel rather than offline versus online. I think as well that uh, e-commerce Food delivery are channels that will be here to stay and will only grow and that we need to all invest in more significantly. And I think that there is room in our region for super apps to come about. So you see WeChat in China, you see other super apps like Kakao in Korea. And I think our region is probably ripe for one of those to enter and make a big difference in the way consumers engage with and also consume different brands and products. As a category, Ice Cream is driven by novelty and by rapid innovation. And that part is likely here to stay. So if you look at the premium ice cream space, it's typically dominated by the large international players. So General Mills, Nestle, Unilever, you see a lot more of local players in the space. They're looking for new experiences. They're looking for new ways, new occasions to consume some of the brands that they love. And there are a number of trends on portion control, on the go consumption, and uh, just new flavors and experiences that we need to ensure that we're on top of and we're delivering to consumer expectations on newness and on no novelty. From a market perspective, you see some of the smaller markets in the region like Vietnam emerging as true possibilities as well as in embedding uh, structures further in markets like Indonesia or the Philippines where there is a large upwardly mobile uh, middle class that, that can be targeted with increasingly premium products.